أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته التيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المذلومين المنتجبين لا سيما مولانا وسيدي صاحب الأسر والزمان روحي وأرواه العالمين له الفداء وأجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف ولعنة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم إلى الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه المبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين ونمكن لهم في الأرض ونري فرعون وهامان وجنودهما ما كانوا يحذرون صدق الله العلي العظيم for the hastening of the return of our twelfth Imam when salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad This evening my brothers and sisters as we mark the tenth of Ashura that is 10 days after the tragedy of Karbala, after we have gone through these nights of the commemoration of the tragedy of the martyrdom of Abba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam and obviously his family members and the companions on the 10th of Muharram on the day of Ashura, we continue to remember this great tragedy and to try and better ourselves, to try and resolve to ourselves that we would not be like the people of Kufa that we will not be like those who pledged support for the Imam of their time and then when he came to them that they turned their back on him. And for tonight's majlis and for the 20th that will be coming up when we will be addressing the community again, I wanted to look at the topic of from the movement of Karbala to the movement of Imam al-Mahdi, may Allah hasten his return, and try and understand some of the nuances of the revolution of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farjahu Sharif, and how we fit into the grand scheme of things. Just as we know that the companions of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam played a role in supporting their Imam on the time or at the time when he needed their assistance that they were there for him, what is our role as it comes or as it relates rather to the Imam of our time? And you know, this post-Ashura period that we have, where we as a community traditionally grieve and continue the grief and lamentation from the beginning of Muharram all the way to the 8th of Rabi'ul Awwal, this is an opportune time for us to be able to delve deeper into such aspects. Because obviously our hearts are more receptive, I would say, in these uh, beginning months of the Islamic year. We're in the mood of commemorating the tragedy of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. And so we all find more time, although our times are limited, but we still try and find more time to dedicate to remembering, to remembering the tragedy of Karbala and all of the events that happened after the tragic day of Ashura. This evening, I want to again look at this topic of the going from the movement of Imam Hussein alayhi salam towards the movement of Karbala. Now, obviously, we have studied to the best of our ability the tragedy of Karbala. We've heard from the Majalis, from the scholars who have been speaking to us not only this year, but even in the past years. So the history part, we have a, um, at least a, a somewhat of a grip on the understanding of the historical basis of the movement of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. We've obviously studied or learnt about the inception of Islam, the message of the Prophet, and why Karbala happened, why the political system got to where it was, where 50 years after the death of Rasulullah, that same ummah that uh, craved the company of the Messenger of Allah would now be craving the blood of the grandson of the Messenger of Allah. That's the historical aspect. Going forward to the future with the 12th Imam's movement, obviously that is something which to an extent is an unknown there are some verses of the Qur'an, two of which we'll re we will review tonight. And obviously the ahadith are many which speak about uh, just before the time of the advent of the 12th Imam, what will happen during the time of his return, and eventually that ideal utopian state 
that situation where the government and the ruling system will be that of the pure Muhammadan Islam, the Islam of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt alayhum was salatu was salam. And one of the things where we can get to that understanding of what that world will look like is by again looking at these verses of the Quran. And one of the things that you know, we really have to appreciate as, the, as believers is that the Quran is not a time-sensitive book or a region-specific book. So yes, you and I will read stories in the Quran as we will see tonight in the two verses I began with from chapter number 28, Surah Al-Qasas, which speak about uh, the specific event of the time of Prophet Musa salam, and the Fir'aun and the apparatus that the Pharaoh had around him to subjugate, to oppress the people. But we have to realize that this story of Bani Israel, of Prophet Musa, of Fir'aun, of Haman, of all of the Quranic release stories are not only related to that time. They were being told to the Prophet, to the early Muslims. There are stories which we read today. But they have, um, they give us a glimpse into the past and obviously they um, give us a glimpse into how we should be preparing for the future. And so when we look at the story of Pharaoh, of Musa, alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses, we actually see a lot of similarities, not only as how the commentators of the Quran have explained many of the events of the Bani Israel and how it uh, would relate to future generations, but looking at the positive aspect, that is the uh, establishment of Prophet Musa as the Khalifa of Allah at his time, as the Prophet of Allah, and having his companions, the Bani Israel, and obviously they have a lot of ups and downs in their history, as we can see if you read Surah Al-Baqarah and other chapters of the Qur'an. But nonetheless, that they had rallied behind their Prophet to at least um, bring an end to the Pharaonic system, or at least a temporary halt to the oppression of the system that Pharaoh had put into place. And for us as believers, how do we draw a parallel in our lives and Again, based on my topic tonight about drawing from Karbala to the 12th Imam is the fact that we, just as the people of Kufa had written letters to the Imam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they had invited the Imam, and then we know obviously what happened, that we also need to be aware that we sometimes fall into a similar situation within our lives. Now, what do I mean by this? I mean the fact that, you know, we attach and obviously, this is a, a need that we have. We attach so much importance to the 12th Imam. And we have to because as the Prophet has told the Muslims in the clear hadith that the person who dies and does not know the Imam of their time dies the death of Jahiliyyah. And so we need to know the Imam of our time. And, you know, we obviously try and connect to him through supplications such as on Friday mornings, Dua of Nudbah such as in the Friday e after, late afternoon or before Maghrib, the Dua of Samat. Um, we recite Nawhaz, Marthiya, we compose poetry in many languages about the 12th Imam. And as much as we pray for his Dhuhr, for his Advent, and we make this Dua every day, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajuhu Sharif, that may Allah hasten his Advent, may Allah hasten the relief which we will get also through the return of the Imam, we have to realize, brothers and sisters, that there is a lot of difficulties and challenges that will take place before the time of the return of the Imam, as we see today around the world. At the actual time of the return of the Imam, things will not be rosy. But eventually there is that light at the end of the tunnel. Just as Bani Israel, as the children of Israel, as the followers of Prophet Musa saw that they had difficulties at an early stage, even when Prophet Moses السلام, you know, announced his prophethood, they were still under the, under the bondage and slavery of the Pharaoh. And it wasn't until actually that they were saved from Egypt that they had a bit of peace and comfort. And then obviously, unfortunately, they made things difficult for themselves. And again, this is very clear within the ayat of the Quran. Going back to the verse I began with, and... Let me just read the Arabic and then the translation of this verse. Again, it comes to us from chapter number 28, Surah Al-Qasas, verses number 5 and 6, where Allah says, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّا عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُدْئِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلُهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ 
In verse number 5, Allah says, But we had willed, Allah had the irada, the intention, the will, to bestow, as he says, our favor upon those who are humiliated, who were deemed weak to be oppressed in the earth, and make of them exemplary leaders to guide people to the way of Allah, and to forge their own lives, and to make them the inheritors of this earth. And then in the very next verse, Allah says, وَنُمَكِّنَ لَهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنُرِيَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَانَ وَجُنُودُهُمَا وَجُنُودَهُمَا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَحْذَرُونَ Allah says, then he t- turns to the, the Pharaoh and his, his institutions, Allah says, that we would establish the people who are deemed weak in the earth. And when it came to the Pharaoh, to the Haman, and their armies, Allah says that we had them experience what they feared for the, what they feared, what they, the fear that they put into the people rather. Meaning that, and we'll look at this in a bit more detail, but meaning that just as Firaun, Haman, and their armies put fear into the hearts of people, oppressed the people, subjugated the people, relegated them to a life of servitude and humiliation, as the Quran talks about killing the men, sparing the women, that Allah says that after everything, the tables were turned, and through infinite justice, that they were now at the re- receiving end of the same forms of oppression that they had launched against humanity. Now I want to just mention three parts from this verse for tonight that get us to reflect and again will help us to continue in this discussion in our next session on the 20th of the Shohada of Karbala. The first part of this verse as Allah says is he talks about those who were as he says deemed weak or oppressed. وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُدْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ This istidhaf, those who are deemed to be oppressed, deemed to be weak, who were downtrodden, who were subjugated by the society that they were in, by the government apparatus. Allah speaks about them in this very unique word of those who were deemed to be weak, the mustadhafin, which is a word I'm sure we've heard if we've read other ayat of the Quran or looked at the ahadith that talk about this unique segment of society, those who are deemed to be weak, who have been deemed to be oppressed. It's interesting that when Ayatollah Nasir Makar Mishrazi, may Allah protect him, in his Tafsir Namuna, under the commentary of this verse, he has a very lengthy discussion of what are the, or who are the Mustad Afin? Who are the people and what does it mean to be quote-unquote deemed weak? He talks about the fact that these people not only at the time again of Musa alayhi salam, but even in our era and all the way until the return of our 12th Imam, are not people who are actually weak. They're not people who are actually um, incapable of forging their own destiny. But he says that they have been so oppressed in the society that they don't have the ability to actually uh, forge their own identity. They don't have the ability to actually create their own destiny for them lives, for their lives, or for their family, or for the community. So they have been subjugated by the, by the time that they live in, by the government they, that they live in, by the system that has been put into place, this uh, very secular, un-Islamic, godless society. And so I told Makarim, it says that these people, the Mustad Afin, they had power. They had strength, they have abilities, they have the aptitude to rise, to actually uh, bring about a change in society for the better. However, the system that they're living in did not let them express this. And so they continue to struggle, they continue to forge ahead to try and bring about a change, at least within their own uh, you know, little social network, their own little social bubble of their family, of like-minded believers, maybe of their community at a small level. But the one thing that Ayatul Makara mentions is that these people never gave up. They never said, well, I live in a system and it's oppressing me, so I'm just going to ride the wave. I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to be like everybody else because that's what the system wants me to do. No, these people recognized that they were being pushed down, but they continued to push up they realized that they were being stepped upon, 
But they didn't let that get to them to give up, to say, well, you know what? Sin is happening all around us. Let's just be believe in the Pharaoh as being God. Let's just do what he wants us to do. Let's just go along with the system and the program and the agenda. No, they actually wanted to maintain their God-given rights. And so they, again, continued to push ahead, recognizing the fact that a day would come when they would be delivered from the Pharaoh and the situation that they were going through. The second part of this verse that I want to briefly touch upon is who would these weak and downtrodden people be victorious over? Allah says that we had desired to bestow a favor upon those who were deemed weak and to make them as the inherit uh, to make them as the leaders of society and to make them of the inheritors. But who were they fighting against? In the next verse, verse number six of Surah Al Qasas, verse number chapter number twenty-eight, Allah gives us three different groups that were working against humanity. Three different segments of society. The first one, obviously, is Pharaoh, is is the Pharaoh Pharaoh. And scholars interpret the Pharaoh as not just being an individual. Yes, he was a person, but we can look at it at a, at a higher level of that being the political system. You, know, you look at the time of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, as the Quran refers to him as, as in the Arabic, and he claimed to be the Lord, as he says, Anna rab, al I am your Lord, the Most High. He talked about in the, in the Quran, the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh at the time of Prophet Moses, that is, alayhi salam, that these rivers that run under my feet and the gardens and all of this land of Egypt is mine. I'm God, basically, he was saying. I'm in charge. Obviously, there was no election process. It wasn't he was democratically elect elected to be in that position. It was hereditary. He took upon the position and he was basically their, their God, their de facto God, as he claimed, obviously. This was Pharaoh at that time, the political system that Musa السلام, had to destroy. Not only, you know, destroy it, obviously, it wasn't through, you know, necessarily miraculous means, but he had to wake up the Bani Israel to again take charge of their own destiny. He had to lead them to launch that movement. It was a very organic movement to get to where they were at. We look at the situation in the world today. We see more than ever in this last, you know, maybe three or four years, 10 years, maybe, maybe if you want to use, uh, you know, that event on September 11th as a catalyst for change in the world, how governments began to cur curtail freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly in, in some cases, even here in the Western world. Limits were being put on what we could do, what we could say, what we could think, maybe even to an extent, by controlling the narrative. So Pharaoh was that political system that Musa had to uh, stand up against. And now we also have to reflect that if this verse is related also to the 12th Imam as a hadith uh, interpreted it to be related to Imam al-Hujjah, what will the 12th Imam do? Alayhi salam, when he comes and has to confront all of these other isms and ideologies out there. The second thing Allah mentions in chapter number 28, verse number 6, after Pharaoh is Haman. Haman was an individual. Some of the reports mention that he was actually from within Bani Israel, but he became deviant and corrupt, left following Nabi Musa salam, and joined the ranks of the Pharaoh. But we can determine or define him rather as being the media and the propaganda system of the Pharaoh. You know, and every government has to have some media apparatus. You know, in certain countries, in certain parts of the world, um, you know, the media is controlled by the government. So the narrative that the government wants to promote is what the media will push forth. In our era, in, the, in where we live, in this part of the world, um, we may say that the news media is independent from the government. And to the, to the most part, yes, it is independent. But also, if you do your homework, you'll realize that in Canada, for example, there are only a handful of families that own all of the media across Canada. So the newspapers, the internet, uh, what you know, the news channels online on the internet, on television, it's only a handful of families that own that. And we would be naive, naive to think that they don't control the narrative of what they want us to hear. 
They might not be pushing a government mandate, but they're pushing some mandate. And again, you see this, you see these terms being thrown around, fake news. This is the fake news media. And to an extent, yes, it is the fake news media, but obviously that term is also being misused by individuals in the world today. But we see how the news today, the media today can make somebody today who is a victim, make them to be the aggressor, and they can make the aggressor to be the victim. Just at the time of, just as at the time of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, and the Fir'aun, Haman was that man who pushed the agenda forth. He pushed that fake news into the minds of Bani Israel and the others to get them to believe this false narrative from the government. And the third part of the verse is, Allah says, وَجُنُودَهُمَا Their armies, their military force to control the people. Again, you look at the world today. Not only in, you know, the so-called third world countries that are run by dictators, where they don't have elections, where they don't have a right to choose leadership. Yes, they use military force to crush any opposition, to crush protests, non-violent peaceful marches that happens in other third world countries and so-called third world countries. But have we ever reflected on the world we live in today? And we've seen this in the news over the last two, three months where certain governments have used their military, either military in military fatigues or in plain clothes, uh, driving unmarked vehicles, randomly and, and arbitrarily arresting people without reading them any rights and taking them away into some rendition operation. And this is happening on television in front of all of our eyes, where the armies which are there to protect, protect society from outside aggression are being used by some countries to prevent, uh, again, peaceful protests, nonviolent marches, rallies, calling for social justice, calling for reformation of certain forces within the country. The third part of the verse, to round off this discussion, is where Allah says that Fir'aun, Haman, and their armies, that they will face the same level of fear as they used to exert on the people. You know, in English, we have this saying that what goes around, comes around. That you can't expect to be unjust, unfair to somebody, whether it's your spouse or your children or what, what have you. You can't expect to be unfair and not have a repercussion. You can't expect that Allah will see injustice happening and not respond to it. You know, as the hadith tell us, a very beautiful hadith, where we're told that the, uh, the shortest distance between a supplicant, one making dua to Allah, is the supplication of the madhloom, of the oppressed. That that would pierce the veils to reaching Allah. Even, as the hadith say, even if that madhloom, that oppressed, was a non-believer. Because... There's many things that maybe Allah will quote-unquote tolerate and not punish immediately or, you know, right away. But in injustice is not one of those. That is one of the things that Allah will and has and continues to take a stand against in the society. And so Allah says in the end of verse number 6 that those same things that Fir'aun, Haman and their armies were instigating against the people, the same force they were using against the people, the same crushing of the voices of opposition that they were using against the people, against the Bani Israel. Uh, keep in mind that the children of Prophet Ya'qub and the offspring of Prophet Ya'qub alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah says that, that they would face that same level of fear in their lives. You know, there's a, there's a quote that is out there which says that people should not fear their governments. Rather, the governments should fear the people. Right? We have to think about that, brothers and sisters. And what does that mean? And I'll give you a hadith to further elaborate on this. But the quote says again that people should not fear their government. Our government is not there to scare us into submission. The governments are there to provide services, to build roads, build hospitals, uh, ensure that our schools have enough money to run the, the schooling system and the programs. We trust our government to use our taxes wisely and responsibly. 
But we shouldn't fear them. We shouldn't worry that we'll go on a protest march and we'll be attacked or we'll be even worse that we'll be, um, that we would be, for example, put into a van and, and, and taken somewhere never to be heard of again. And so as we conclude, we just bring up a hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali alayhi salam, which is mentioned in the book Mizan al-Hikmah, and it's hadith number 4647, in which Imam Ali alayhi salam has been quoted as saying, يَوْمُ الْعَدْلِ عَلَى الظَّالِمْ أَشَدُّ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجَوْرِ عَلَى الْمَظْلُومِ He says the day that justice is brought to the wrongdoer, to the oppressor, to the dhalim, will be much more severe than the day that the oppression was done to the oppressed. Very beautiful statement from the commander of the faithful. That when it comes to the adl, the justice that will be shown to the wrongdoers, it's going to be something so severe because justice has to be done. It has to be swift and it has to be seen. And that justice will be much more severe than the oppression which the oppressors were giving out to the people, the innocent people who were just demanding their God-given rights. And so to wrap up and conclude tonight's majlis, we realize that as Allah said in the verse 20, verse number 5 rather of Surah al Qasas, chapter number 28, that a day will come when those who are deemed weak on this earth will be made the inheritors, will be, will be made the imams rather, the leaders of society. And they will be made as the, or they will be the inheritors of this earth. Now, this promise of Allah came down 14 centuries ago. It has not yet been fulfilled. It, didn't be, it was not fulfilled at the time of Rasulullah. There was still kufr running rampant. There was still polytheism very much on display. It didn't occur during the time of the first imam, the second imam, the third imam. From the fourth to the eleventh imam, as we know, the situation was so uh, in, fl in flux and in change that this verse never was applied. And so we have to submit to the fact that a day will come where this verse will be implemented. The oppressed will get their rights. They will become the leaders of humanity. They will become those who inherit this earth, as even the Bible says that the meek shall inherit the earth. And as believers, we say that this is at the time of the advent of Imam al-Hujjah, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajuhu sharif. However, as we said, that, that does not mean it will come overnight. It will not come with anything other than difficulty, with hardship, with trials, with tribulations. Just as Prophet Musa and the Bani Israel had to go through so much and lose so many and go through so many hardships, but eventually they made it to the promised land. And as believers, we also have that same conviction that this verse will become manifest. And we pray that we can be of those to follow behind our Imam, our leader, Imam al-Hujjah, and be of those to bring about that revolution to bring about justice upon this earth. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight, as we conclude on this 10th of Ashura, 10th after the Shuhada of Karbala, 10 days after the day of Ashura, we recall, brothers and sisters, that the tragedies post-Ashura were no less difficult than the day of Ashura itself. We know that the Ahlul Bayt started the journey from Medina to Mecca. That was the first part of their journey. The second part was from Mecca to being surrounded in Karbala. That was the second part of the journey. This third part of the journey and the fourth part were from Karbala to Kufa and Kufa to Sham. And what a difficult time it was, brothers and sisters, because yes, on the day of Ashura was where Abu Abdullah salam, lost his life. It was where Qasim ibn Hassan was killed in the most gruesome of ways, the young boy. It was where a young man like Ali al-Akbar, the one who was the most resembling of to Rasulullah in his speech, in his mannerisms, in the way he looked, was killed on the day of Ashura. 
Yes, the 10th of Muharram was the day when Abul Fadl Abbas salam, lost his right arm, he lost his left arm, and he lost his life in the lap of his master, Abba Abdullah. Yes, the 10th of Muharram was the day that the young Ali al Hazrat Ali al Asghar, a six month old, was shot in the neck with the arrow that went in one part of his neck and came out of the other side, with Abba Abdullah catching all of the blood of his young infant son in his hands as he's holding this baby in his hands. But we can't forget the tragedies of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. We can't forget the tragedy especially of the ladies of the camp of Abba Abdullah. We recall that he's on these days after the day of Ashura, that as the tragedy had unfolded, and as the family were getting ready to be taken from the plains of Karbala, to be taken to the city of Kufa, that eventually when they reached to the gates of Kufa, and they were entering into the city, we're told by the books of history that the whole city had been decorated by the, by the orders of the Khalifa. Yazid had given the orders. His governor in Kufa had put the order out and the call out to begin to decorate the city. And as the city was being decorated, and as the people were standing at the gates to see what was this, all this commotion about, what was the celebration all about, it was in these days and nights, my brothers and sisters, that the Ahlul Bayt salam, were being paraded, they were walking all the way from Karbala into the city of Kufa. And as they were walking, and as the heads of the Shuhada were on the spears, and people began to see who these people were, they began to realize, some of them began to realize that these were not rebels against the Caliph. These were not criminals, that this was the Ahlul Bayt salam. This was the same family whose Father Amir al-Mu'mineen was, was the Khalifa at the time and had his base in the city of Kufa. Brothers and sisters, I'll leave you with one last point and that is when Lady Zainab salam, when Lady Zainab enters into the, area, into the city of Kufa and she stands in front of the curse of Baydullah bin Ziyad Mal'un and as the people are gloating, the troops of the army are, are reveling at this, at this site that Lady Zainab salam, begins to speak she tells the people of Kufa in a powerful, loud voice. She speaks in such a voice, brothers and sisters, that the people say that an individual was saying who was blind. He says that I heard a voice and had I not realized that Amir al-Mu'mineen had been killed many years before, I would have thought that this was him speaking. He says that I heard a voice speaking that, that resembled the voice of Amir al-Mu'mineen. I heard words being uttered that resembled the way that Amir al-Mu'mineen used to speak. But this wasn't Amir al-Mu'mineen, but this was his beloved daughter, Lady Zainab alayhi salam. And she addresses the Kufans, she addresses the treachery of the people of Kufa, and she tells the people of Kufa that may you never smile, may you never have joy and happiness in your lives, may you weep over what you have done to us, how low you could be, you invited us to the city, you told us that you would give us your, your pledge of allegiance, you guaranteed Abba Abdullah that you would be there for him. And then at the end, you turned your backs on us. You turned your backs on us, the Ahlul Bayt. And this is the situation that we are now in. As they can see the heads of the Shuhada on the spears. As they see Imam Zainul Abidin salam in chains. As they see the women of the caravan, the women of the family of the Prophet in chains, in distress, in difficulties. And it was in this way, brothers and sisters, that in this journey, the Ahlul Bayt suffered so much so that even in the time of Kufa, that even though they're in a city that once had love for the Ahlul Bayt, that now they were being paraded in the streets as if they were common criminals, as if they were enemies of the state. We ask Allah on this night where we commemorate the 10th after the Shuhada of Karbala to Allah to accept our acts of worship in this new year and in this month of Muharram. We ask Allah to pardon our sins. We ask Allah to keep us all on the path of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. We ask Allah for the alleviation of the suffering of all of humanity, especially the believers, those who are suffering in Kashmir, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, wherever the believers are suffering, in North America, in Europe, where the mu'mineen are going through hardships, we ask Allah to bring about ease after the difficulties that we face. Ya Allah, we are going through this un, unheard of precedent of the pandemic of COVID-19. Ya Allah, we ask you to bring about some comfort. We ask you for the experts to find a cure for this 
that for this pandemic that we can return to some life of normalcy, that we can worship you, Ya Allah, in congregation, that we can come back to our centers, that we can pray in jama'at, that we can worship you, Ya Allah, in congregation. And last but not least, we ask you, Ya Allah, to hasten the return of our 12th Imam, Imam Al-Hujjah, and allow us to be those who invite towards Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, for the thawab of all of our marhumin, especially the marhumin of our communities, our family, our friends, the ulama, the shuhada, the shuhada of Karbala, Surah Al-Mubarakatul Fatiha. But before that, one loud salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.